So this is a presentation on wireless connectivity for embedded systems. I'll start with a brief indu introduction about myself. My name is Kristen Jakonski. I am the engineering manager for the embedded system group at California Eastern Laboratories. Uh, I did my undergraduate at Northwestern and got my master's at University of Southern California. As I mentioned, currently I am the engineering manager for CEL's embedded systems group. Uh, previously, I have been an RF engineer designing cell phones for Motorola and also a baseband RF engineer for Motorola's automotive division uh, working on telematics products. So today we're going to first review the presentation objectives, then go through some design considerations for wireless embedded systems, and finally we'll review an overview of some uh, commonly used wireless standards. So let's start out with the presentation objectives. The first objective is uh, to provide an overview of high-level considerations when adding wireless connectivity to an embedded product. For example, what standard to use? Uh, would Wi-Fi better suit your application, Zigbee, Bluetooth, etc.? What type of network topology? Uh, are you just doing a simple cable replacement where a point-to-point -point, uh, topology would work best? Or would a star or a mesh work better for your situation? What type of antenna? Are you working on a product where it's in a metal enclosure and you will need to use an external antenna? Or would an internal antenna be better for your product? What are some of the issues that will be encountered during the design and pre-production phases of the project? Uh, RF development is an entirely different beast from baseband or microprocessor development. So I thought I would review a few of the, uh, the key topics to, to, be, to watch out for. And finally, everyone's favorite topic, what about regulatory certification? Um, this is uh, an area which is uh, unfortunately a requirement, but can, uh, if not planned for well in advance, can really cause uh, serious delays to your, the launch of your product. Finally, I'd like to show how these considerations are used in several standards commonly in use today. Okay, so let's start um, designing a wireless embedded system. So here are some of the topics I'll review. First of all, what is the motivation to add wireless connectivity? Secondly, we'll review the RF design methodology, some of the major points to, to keep in mind um, when you're doing your RF design. I'll review some commonly done tests during your design verification. Um, we'll go through some points on regulatory certification. Um, I'll give you some basics on antennas. And finally, we'll cover some networking basics. So why do you want to add wireless connectivity to your product? Can anyone give me a motivation? Got a t-shirt for you. Get rid of the cable. Get rid of the cable, OK. OK, so I came up with uh, two main motivations. The first one is convenience. Uh, let's say you have decided that you want to install the, the latest lighting system in your house. Do you really want to rip out every single wall to put a wire through to, up to the ceiling to the walls? It's actually much easier to, to use a wireless and, and much more cost effective to use a wireless solution. The second example is accessing your network from anywhere in your office. Uh, here at uh, DevCon, all of us have mobile devices. Some of us have several. Uh, we wouldn't be able to achieve the same level of connectivity um, if we weren't able to access the internet through, through our wireless devices. The second motivation is additional functionality. Um, it's very, very easy to connect devices in parallel. In fact, it's, uh, it's a de facto standard when you're, when you're doing wireless devices. Uh, with a wired device, you have to run a, de uh, a wire through every single connection to make the parallel connections. Um, it, it's, it's much easier to do it with a wireless network. Um, this helps to improve the robustness of the network. Secondly, using a standard allows interoperability with other devices. For example, Bluetooth, Zigbee, or Wi-Fi. Um, if you go to the store and buy a Bluetooth headset, you can be guaranteed that it will be work with your cell phone because it follows the standard and it has been certified. The final point is that freedom of mobility can increase productivity. For example, let's say that you work for the Department of Transportation and in your territory there's a bridge which is aging. And this bridge, uh, you want to make sure that it's not reaching a point where it's becoming dangerous for people to drive on top of it. Uh, it's very easy to develop a network of wireless sensors, add some batteries to them, and you can deploy the sensors throughout the bridge um, much easier than it would be to, uh, to do it with wires. 
Second example is a baby monitor. Say your son or daughter is asleep upstairs, but you want to get work done in the rest of the house. It's, uh, it's much, much more convenient and it will increase your productivity if you're able to move around the house while making sure that your son or daughter is still safely sleeping. Okay, so let's review some, uh, some main points in the RF design methodology. The first point is that designing at RF frequencies requires different equipment and skills than low speed digital or analog designs. Um, if you're not familiar with using a network analyzer or a spectrum analyzer, um, these will be pieces of equipment that you now will need to, to use to, uh, to make sure that your product meets its requirements. Um, if, you're, if you're a manager, you will need to make sure that you have someone who, can, who has been trained um, in operating these pieces of equipment. The output of each hardware block must be impedance matched to the input of the following block to ensure that minimal power is lost throughout the system. For example, let's say you're doing a transmitter design. You have a power amplifier, followed by a filter, followed by an antenna. Uh, if, you, if you get your power amplifier just right, but you don't have it matched properly to the next stage, which is the filter, you could lose half of your power before it even reaches the antenna. So it's very important uh, to make sure that you have your impedances matched. Uh, generally in RF, we either use 50 ohms or 75 ohms. Or if you, uh, if you know what the following block is, you can conjugately match to that block also to, to get the maximum power transfer. PCB layout is very important. Every trace, via, and component on a circuit board can potentially create parasitics, which will impact your results. I cannot stress this enough. If you have a long trace running by a switching power supply, um, it's, it's very possible that that will create a, a radiator and uh, you may have regulatory issues uh, that you uh, would be unaware of until you reached your, uh, your regulatory certifications. Proper grounding is critical to good performance. Um, with, a, with a low speed design, uh, sometimes you may be able to get away without a solid ground plane. Um, in, in RF, it's, it's generally a requirement. And finally, unintentionally radiating designs can cause the product to fail regulatory certifications. So um, it's very important uh, to, to make sure that you, you address this early in, in the development of your project to avoid any surprises later on. So I thought I would run through some typical tests that are run on the transmitter side. The first is output power. So output power is, is generally one of the most important uh, measures of the performance of your transmitter. So this is uh, typically measured um, over the entire voltage range uh, of your product, the entire frequency range from the low end of the frequency to the high end, and also over temperature. Frequency error. Is the VCO stable over temperature and voltage? Um, it's very important to make sure that your frequency is not drifting, that you don't have any uh, spurious oscillations, that type of thing. If you're designing to a standard, generally they have a, a, a frequency error requirement that you also must meet to make sure that you are uh, centered on the channel that you are intending to operate on. Current draw. How efficient is the PA? Typically in a, in a, in a RF design, the transmitter will consume uh, the bulk of the power. So if your power amplifier is not, uh, is not efficient, um, you could really be uh, you know, hurting yourself. Uh, if you're doing a battery powered application, um, it's especially important to make sure that you're operating your PA in the most efficient way possible. Adjacent channel power ratio. This is a measure of the PA distortion. Uh, a PA is, is inherently a nonlinear device and so it's very important that you try to minimize the nonlinearities. Um, in an extreme case, it's actually possible for your signal to spill over into an adjacent band and causing problems uh, with, with other neighboring pieces of equipment. And finally, error vector magnitude. Uh, this tells you how close uh, the constellation points are to ideal. So here we have an 8 PSK constellation and here we have a 16 QAM constellation. Now this 8 PSK constellation, um, because uh, 2 to the third is 8, will, you will be able to send uh, three data bits for every symbol. Uh, with your 16 QAM constellation, you'll be able to send four data bits. Now, what error vector magnitude measures is how close these points are to ideal. So let's say you, you are targeting this point here and you take a number of measurements that are you know, in, this, in this circle right here. Um, so what you want to make sure is that 
um, your, the receiver is able to discriminate between this point and this point. So if you had a lot of noise and your, your signals are going all over like this and this one's going all over like this, um, it's, it's entirely possible that your receiver would interpret the, the received signal incorrectly, which would cause a bit error. So um, when, when you're working with constellations, um, there's inherently a trade-off between um, spectral efficiency and noise. So if you have a low noise system, um, you can have these bits uh, you know, be closer together um, and therefore transmit more data with a single symbol. However, if you have a noisy system, uh, this is a little bit more forgiving and for the discriminator. So it's better to use the, uh, a, lower, a lower data rate um, when you have uh, more noise in your system. OK, let's move over to the receiver side. So the first test is sensitivity. This asks what is the minimum signal that can be demodulated. So generally what you do is you pick an a error rate percentage that you're aiming for, uh, for example, 1%. So what you would say is, um, let's say I put in a signal of minus 100 and my bit error rate is, much, is, is at zero. So then I increase to minus 101, minus 102 until I start to uh, see bit errors. Uh, the, the, greatest, the, the lowest signal point at which um, I'm able to uh, discriminate less than 1% uh, bit error rate is defined as your sensitivity. Sensitivity is, is inherently a, a nonlinear thing. So once you start to reach the 1% point, you will very, very quickly uh, start to have much higher uh, bit error rates. Secondly, noise figure. How much noise is the circuitry adding? Uh, generally, the first device uh, on a receiver chain is the LNA, and this typically dictates your noise figure. So it's very important that uh, you minimize the amount of noise going into your LNA in order to uh, achieve the best sensitivity possible. Current draw. How much current does the circuit draw? Uh, while it's not as important on the, on the, as it is on the transmitter side, um, current draw can be a very good indicator if there is something wrong with your design. Um, so it's very important to, uh, to measure this uh, repeatedly. Finally, intermodulation distortion. This is a measure of how the performance is affected by certain tones due to receiver nonlinearities. So let's say that I put these two tones in here, which are denoted as F1 and F2. Uh, this is the frequency domain, and this is uh, the output power level. So I put these two tones in F1 and F2. In a perfectly ideal situation, you would not get any harmonics. Uh, but because a receiver is inherently nonlinear, you will get uh, second order products, third order products, et cetera. So over here, we have F1 plus F2, which is generated by the adding of these two signals. Um, this is a second order product, as is this, F2 minus F1. Over here, we have our third order products, 2F2 minus F1 and 2F1 minus F2. Here we have our fifth order products, and you can keep continuing uh, going on for quite a while. Um, so the purpose of this is if your system is too nonlinear and it creates too many harmonics, you can actually desensitize your receiver or possibly even cause harmonics which could back radiate through the antenna and cause you to fail your regulatory certifications. Okay, let's move on to regulatory certification. So the certification process demonstrates to the regulatory body that your product meets the requirements for radio transmissions. If an electronic product will be sold in a particular country, it must conform to that country's requirements. For example, in the United States, we have the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. In Canada, we have Industry Canada, or IC. In the European Union, we have ETSI. In Australia, we have the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Uh, if you ever look at an Australian uh, a, a label of a device that's been certified for use in Australia, uh, the, the label marking is called the CTIC mark. In South Korea, we have the Korea Communications Commission. And in Japan, we have the VCCI. So all of these bodies have the same function, which is to guarantee that a product shipped in, in their country meets that their, their regulatory requirements. <coughs> Um, this is both for emissions and for susceptibility. So regulatory tests differ slightly by country, but fall into two general categories. The first is emissions. 
Emissions is a measure of the signals coming out of the product. So your two main emissions that you're going to have are radiated emissions and conducted emissions. Radiated emissions are the emissions that are measured uh, coming over the air. Conducted emissions are measured through a conducted path. Typically, um, if you have a product that is powered by AC, this will be the emissions coming out of the power supply and going back into the, the, the power grid. Um, you also have a, a 6 dB bandwidth. This uh, tells how, how close to, uh, how far the signal spreads outside of the desired bandwidth. Power spectral density, which is a measure of the, uh, the power in the frequency domain. Peak output power, which is a total measure of uh, the absolute output power of your device. And band edge compliance. So all of the, uh, the entire uh, RF spectrum is broken into bands. So you have to be very careful that your energy does not spill into a neighboring band that you are not licensed for. For example, if you're operating in the 2.4 gigahertz band, the, uh, the range of operation is 2.405 gigahertz to 2.48 gigahertz. There is a restricted band just uh, north of that, uh, just above 2.48 gigahertz. So if you're operating on the highest channel in the, in the ISM band, you just need to make sure that your signal does not spill over into the 2.48 gigahertz band um, because you may interfere with someone else who is uh, licensed to use that band. Susceptibility or immunity. Uh, this is how the product is affected by external radio disturbances. Here we have uh, radiated immunity. So what happens here is your product is blasted with RF energy at different frequencies and different power levels, and your product is tested to see how well it responds. Conducted immunity, um, the, the disturbance is applied through a conducted path, such as through the AC power line, and electrostatic discharge, which is where your product is generally zapped with a ESD. So with susceptibility or immunity, there's a few different levels of compliance. Um, the first and obviously most desirable is that nothing happens. So when your product is shocked with an ESD strike, there is no impact to the performance. It may be possible that your product resets, but then successfully recovers. This would be a different class of operation. Or the worst case, which is when your product receives the ESD strike, it, uh, it locks up and it's, it takes a power cycle to recover or something like that. So different products uh, have different requirements. Um, so you may have to meet different requirements depending on uh, your product class and also the country that you're certifying for. Okay, so here are some tips for a successful certification. First, and I cannot stress this enough, is to start early. Schedule a pre-screen, which is about a day of testing to test high risk areas as soon as the device is close to final. Uh, this is often well, well, well worth your time and money. Um, for example, you may want to test your radiated harmonics. Uh, you may want to test your band edge compliance. Some things that are in general more of the difficult tests to meet. Software development may be required to put the device in the proper testing modes. Uh, the way the FCC or Etsy tests is not your typical um, uh, mode of operation. Uh, in, in real life, your product will be cycling on and off uh, while it's transmitting data. Uh, for the FCC, what they generally want is your product to stay on at a particular channel, either using a modulated or an unmodulated signal. So because this is a mode that your product does not need to support for um, the, the final product, you may, not have, uh, you may not have a way to put your product in this mode. So. Um, it's very important to know that these modes will be required, um, so plan for them in advance. Secondly, make sure that the device is final before starting certification testing. Uh, once your certification testing is run, changes to the circuit that affect RF performance could require recertification. This includes changes to the power amplifier, the frequency generation circuit, um, and the antenna. So it's very important to make sure that you, uh, that you do not intend to make any more changes before you start your FCC certification. Um, you could have to possibly do a permissive change or in the worst case, completely re re redo your certification. And finally, don't be afraid to call in an expert. 
EMC consultants can significantly reduce the time, cost, and risk of a certification. Uh, they can oversee the testing, help to resolve failures, and assist with the filing documentation. Uh, it, it's your test house uh, will have the names of several consultants to use, and I highly recommend that, especially the first time you go through it, um, to call in an expert to help. Uh, the, 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 the guidelines, while they may seem straightforward, um, there are a lot of nuances involved that only an expert um, can help with. Okay, let's move on and talk about antennas. Can someone give me a definition of an antenna? What is it? A wire. A wire. Okay. So what I came up for the definition of an antenna is the purpose of an antenna is to help the RF signal to radiate through free space as efficiently as possible. So the size of the antenna is inversely proportional to the frequency where it operates. At 900 megahertz, a quarter wavelength monopole is 8 centimeters long. At 2.4 gigahertz, it's 3 centimeters. And at 5 gigahertz, it's 1.5 centimeters. So as a visual example, so this would be a quarter wavelength monopole at 900 megahertz. This is the same quarter wavelength monopole at 2.4 gigahertz. And this is the same one at 5 gigahertz. So as you can see, the antenna length gets significantly shorter when you go higher in frequency. So this is a trade-off that you will have to make in your product. Uh, if you decide you want to operate at 900 megahertz, you will need somewhere to put a long antenna. So if you're designing a tiny little product, it may be more effective for you to use a 5 gigahertz or a 2.4 gigahertz frequency. So antenna performance ultimately depends on the surrounding environment. For example, the ground plane. So here in this device, we have a solid ground plane, which will help to um, have the antenna radiate the most efficiently. Surrounding components will also play a big role on your antenna performance. Uh, if you have a requirement to put your product in a metal box, you will not be able to use an internal antenna. You will have to have the antenna outside of the box. Plastic can also wreak havoc on antenna performance. Um, if you have plastic very, very close to your antenna, um, it can significantly detune it. How far away you can put your, your piece of plastic uh, and still maintain good antenna performance is, is an art rather than a science. So here are some types of antennas. So on the left we have external types of antennas and on the right we have integrated antennas. So here is the uh, most simplest type of antenna, it's a dipole. So what happens here is the signal comes in here and this is a quarter wavelength and this is a quarter wavelength. So this, the radiation field uh, radiates in this direction. So this is nice because you don't need a ground plane. So if you have a lot of room, uh, depending on what frequency you're operating at, uh, this, is a, this, is a good, this is a good option. Uh, a monopole is a variation on the dipole. So what you have here is your signal will come in in this direction, and then it would radiate through, through this uh, point here. Uh, this antenna has a, requires a ground plane. And so the purpose of the ground plane is to actually create an image underneath. So if your signal comes in here, you would get one radiation pattern up here, and you would get a second radiation pattern down here. So this is, uh, this is good for designs that are space constrained because you only need half the distance uh, of the antenna as you would for the dipole. A loop antenna is a variation on this. Uh, this is a quarter wavelength, and this is a quarter wavelength separated by a gap. So it's, it's basically the same, the same idea as these. A Yagi antenna, I think most of us are familiar with these. These are often used um, on rooftops for TV reception. So what happens is the signal comes in here, and only one of these, radi only one of these elements will generally be active. Um, so this will be a, a half wavelength, uh, the same as the dipole, and these other elements will act to form a beam uh, which will help to create uh, gain for the antenna, which will improve your signal performance. So if, you, if your product requires an uh, internal antenna, uh, there's a few options here. The first is an inverted F antenna. So this antenna is actually placed on the PCB in the copper. So what you have first is you have a solid ground plane throughout the entire PCB. And then you have uh, this right here is the radiating arm. And this is connected to ground. 
So if you think about it, this is really the same as the monopole antenna, just kind of on its side. Um, so this, this long arm is generally um, around a quarter of a wavelength. If you do not have enough room to put a whole quarter of a wavelength antenna, you may use a meander antenna, which is basically the inverted F antenna with all the lines squashed together. Chip antennas are also popular. Um, the main advantage of a chip antenna is that it uses a material with a very high dielectric constant. And this allows um, the antenna length to be decreased um, to get the same frequency out of it. So for example, at 2.4 gigahertz, uh, you may be able to get an antenna as small as an 0805 component. A patch antenna um, operates along the same principles as the chip. Okay, so let's move on and talk about some antenna patterns. The optimal antenna pattern is dependent on the application. For a mobile device, you want a highly isotropic or uniform pattern. So what this means is, for example, if you, this is the same antenna as the previous slide, um, your antenna pattern will be rotating in this direction. So as you can see, it's very uniform. Um, however, the gain may be 0 dB or 2 dB, very, very, very low. But this is really good if you have a mobile application where you don't know which direction the user will be pointing. If you have a stationary device communicating with another stationary device, a directional antenna can improve your performance. So here I have a, a Yagi antenna, and here is the corresponding antenna pattern. As you can see, there is a lot of gain in the x direction and not a little, uh, just a tiny bit of gain in the minus x direction. So this is very useful um, if you have a stationary application. Uh, if we go back to the example of uh, the, the TV uh, receiver, um, you, the location of your house does not move and the location of the TV tower does not move. So if you were to point your antenna uh, at the location of the TV station, uh, you would actually get a lot of gain in this direction, which would help to receive your, which would help to improve your link budget and therefore um, improve your TV reception. However, if, you, if this was a mobile device and the antenna happened to be pointing um, towards a signal over here, you would get a very poor result. So there's an inherent trade-off involved uh, between the type of antenna that's best for your application. Okay, so I wanted to touch briefly on MIMO. MIMO is a very important topic right now. It's a very hot research topic. MIMO is used uh, both for LTE, for the 4G cell systems, and it's also used for some of the newer uh, Wi-Fi systems, specifically 802.11n. So MIMO stands for Multiple Input, Multiple Output. And what this means is that several antennas at the transmitter and or the receiver uh, are used to improve performance. So here I have my transmitter, and I have three antennas associated with it. And I have my receiver, and there's a corresponding three antennas. So there's two ways that I can implement MIMO. The first is if I have a poor signal strength, um, I can use my extra antennas to achieve spatial diversity. This will increase the range and reliability without increasing the transmit power. So for example, on my transmitter, let's say that I put the same signal out on all three uh, legs of my antenna. Um, this leg here will have a much better chance of receiving a combined signal, which is stronger than the signal that would be received from just one antenna. So this is a very easy way, without increasing your transmit power, to uh, increase your range and your link budget. The other option is if you are in a low noise environment, um, you could do spatial multiplexing. So the way this works is you would have one independent data stream come out on this antenna, one independent da data stream come out on this antenna, and a third stream come out on this antenna. This allows you to increase your data rate and throughput without increasing your bandwidth. Uh, this will improve the spectral efficiency because instead of only transmitting one stream, now you can transmit three streams in the same frequency band. So, Looking at this at a high level, if you are in a low, noise, a low noise environment, you can use MIMO to increase your data rate. If you are in a high noise environment, you can use MIMO to uh, increase your link budget and improve your RF performance. 
Okay, so let's touch on some basics of networking. The first point is that networking assumptions are inherently different for a wireless network. For a wired network, the assumptions are pretty straightforward. If two devices are connected with a wire, the message is successful. If two devices are disconnected, you can assume that the message will be unsuccessful. For a wireless network, you may start out by assuming that all devices within a reasonable distance will be able to hear the message. However, if one of the devices is in a fade, the message will be unsuccessful. So the, the key point here is that at any time due to fading, you may not receive a signal that you were expecting to receive. So your software needs to be able to react appropriately. By using a mesh topology, the nodes can work together to get the message from the source to the destination. Uh, a classic problem in wireless networking is the near-far problem. So let's say I've got three nodes here, node A with its corresponding range, node B with its range, and node C with its range. Now in this picture, A can talk to B, and B can talk to C, but A cannot talk to C because they can't hear each other. They're outside of their range. So let's say both A and C want to send a message to B. They both transmit at the same time. There is a collision at point B, and neither message is received. Um, because B is able to hear both messages. So this is a very important problem in wireless networking um, and again something that the software needs to be written for to support. Okay, let's review some wireless networking topologies. The first uh, networking topology is a point-to-point. -point. So this is used for an application such as a cable replacement or if you're transmitting one audio stream to a receiver. It's really just two nodes talking to each other through a dedicated link. The star topology is slightly more complicated. In this topology, we have a central node which acts as the access point or gateway, and we have other nodes which are able to talk uh, through it. So these two nodes right here are not able to talk to each other directly. They must go through the access point. A uh, common application where this is used is Wi-Fi. In legacy Wi-Fi, you generally have an access point and all the devices in the room will connect to each other through the access point. This is also not too difficult to uh, implement via software. The third network topology is a mesh or a peer-to-peer. -peer. So here in the center, I have uh, my gateway or my coordinator um, and it is connected to um, both endpoints, which are blue, and routers, which are green. So routers are able to talk to other devices in the network, whereas an endpoint must connect to only one router or the coordinator. So the main advantage of a mesh networking system is that it significantly can improve the reliability of your network. For example, um, without a mesh network, it would be very difficult for this node to talk to this node. Uh, you would have to make sure that the output power and the sensitivity were such that the link budget between these two nodes um, was sufficient for the signal to be received. With a mesh network, you can use much lower power and still have the same effect. So this, the, 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 node, uh, the signal can be routed through many, many different paths here. So if one of these devices goes down, um, it's possible uh, for your message to still be completed. So meshing uh, is very useful in terms of robustness. Uh, it can be very, very difficult to, to implement in terms of software. Uh, there's a lot of corner cases that must be uh, considered and that type of thing. Okay, so fading in wireless networks. So there's two types of fading, large-scale fading and small-scale fading. So I'm gonna talk about large-scale fading first. So here on the right, I have a graph of antenna displacement versus signal power. So what you see is that there's a general trend. As my signal, as my distance uh, gets larger, my signal strength decreases. I think we're all familiar with this phenomenon. If I'm talking to someone who is close to me, I can talk in a much lower voice and have them hear me than if they're all the way at the other side of the room. So in general, the signal strength of a wireless signal decreases proportionally with distance. In free space, a general rule that we use is that the signal strength decreases proportionally to the square of the distance. In an indoor environment where there is a lot of multipath and other obstructions, uh, the signal strength may decrease proportionally 
at a much higher rate, perhaps to D to the fourth. So that's why uh, you may need a much higher signal strength to achieve uh, the same distance indoors as you would uh, than you would outdoors. Transmission range is inversely proportional to frequency. So low frequencies have a longer range than higher frequencies. So if you're designing a system and you decide you want to use 900 megahertz, uh, you will get approximately three times the range out of it as you would a 2.4 gigahertz antenna. So again, there's, there's all sorts of trade-offs involved in, in this. So here I have a, a picture of node A talking to node B. Um, if node A and node B are very close together, um, I can use a low signal strength to talk with them. If node A and node B are separated by a large distance, I must use a much higher output power uh, to have the signal received. The second type of fading is called small scale fading. So here I have the same graph of antenna distance versus signal power. And you can see that there's really no, no significant trend here. For example, this point right here, um, there's very little distance between this point and this point. However, there's a great uh, difference in the amount of signal power that is received. So small changes in position, and by that I mean less than one wavelength, can cause large changes in signal strength due to multipath effects or Doppler shifts. So for example, uh, a, a very common use case that I think everyone is probably familiar with is if you're driving in your car and uh, you're listening to the radio and you come to a stoplight and all of a sudden you have a lot of static. If you move your car forward five feet and all of a sudden the signal gets much better, that's an example of small scale fading. So here I have uh, the same two nodes, A and B. So now we've got three paths. We've got the direct path from A to B. There's also a tree um, which the signal reflects off of before it hits B and here is a second tree. So now let's say that B moves over just a tiny bit. So as you can see, B just moved over just a tiny bit. And now what happens is these two signals happen to be at just the right point that they destructively interfere with each other and basically cancel each other out. So just by moving this tiny little distance, um, you may significantly change the amount of signal strength that you're receiving because now the only path that you're receiving is, is this top one here. Okay, so let's move on and talk about some uh, wireless standards. The first question is, should you use a wireless standard or not? Or is a proprietary protocol more important for your application? Uh, for the wireless standard, there's a few advantages. The first one is interoperability. Uh, if you are only designing one element of the network, for example, if you're uh, designing a uh, Bluetooth headset and you don't plan to also design the cell phone, um, by relying on interoperability, you can guarantee that your product will be able to talk with others on the market. Robustness is another key advantage. What this means is that sometimes these standards are, are difficult to implement. So if you've got several companies implementing the standard at the same time, it's quite possible that different companies will find different bugs in the standard and the entire standard can become more robust by implementing all the fixes all at once. The third point is mass market potential. Um, at some point, uh, a very popular standard becomes a brand in itself. For example, Wi-Fi. Uh, if you go to the store, you may uh, be willing to pay extra money for a printer which has Wi-Fi in it because you have a cell phone with Wi-Fi in it. Whereas if it's using a proprietary protocol, there may be no advantage for you and you would not be able to be willing to pay the extra money. There's also some disadvantages with using a wireless standard. Uh, the first one is achieving interoperability. When you have several different companies independently developing uh, products that are supposed to be working on the same standard, there are inherently very small nuances which may um, cause you know, problems um, that have to be resolved uh, between the different companies. The second disadvantage is the inflexibility of the standard. Um, let's say that you're designing uh, to a specific standard and you come up with a great new idea for something that would help your product. Well, if you're using a standard, now you have to go back and petition the standards body to get it ratified. This process could take years. 
So if you want to stay with a standard, oftentimes uh, the inflexibility can sometimes be a disadvantage. If you decide to go with a proprietary protocol, one of the main advantages is security. Um, it's very, very difficult for someone to reverse engineer a proprietary protocol, especially if you put a lot of thought into it. Um, this can make it such that it's virtually impossible for someone to break into your network. Second advantage is flexibility. If halfway through the development process you decide that you want uh, a new feature, uh, because it's a proprietary protocol, it's very easy for you to implement that. A disadvantage is the development effort required. Uh, it can be a lot of work to make a wireless standard, especially one that is uh, very robust. Um, so if you decide to do a proprietary protocol, you will be on your own with all of that development. And the final point is that standards overlap, so there may be more than one right standard for your application. So I'm just going to review some of uh, the ver most very popular standards. Uh, I'm going to talk about Wi-Fi, which operates at both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Bluetooth, which, which operates at 2.4 gigahertz. And IEEE 802.15.4, which uh, operates uh, in the sub gigahertz band and also at 2.4 gigahertz. Within IEEE 802.15.4, we have several different uh, standards, including Zigbee, Z-Wave, wireless, and bus, et cetera. So one of the main features of Wi-Fi is its high data rate. 802.11n can operate at a theoretical data rate of 600 megabits per second, and 802.11ac can operate greater than one gigabit per second. Now going back to our network topologies, uh, legacy Wi-Fi uses a star. I think we're all familiar with this. Uh, you have an access point, and all of your devices communicate through the access point to each other or to the, back to the network. 802.11a, g, and n uh, are starting to implement a point-to-point -point topology. This is called Wi-Fi Direct. So a common use case for this is if you want your printer to talk to your cell phone so that you can print out an email. Um, now you can go directly from the cell phone to the printer without having to associate through the base station. It's a lot more convenient and consumer friendly. 802.11s standard uh, is uh, introducing a, a WLAN mesh. So this is available in both the static and ad hoc topologies. And what this means is that you know, it's possible for now, you to, now for you to take the, the high data rates of Wi-Fi and include the robustness of a mesh. So this is an up and coming standard which shows a lot of promise. As I mentioned before, uh, Wi-Fi uh, 802.11n uses MIMO. So if you go to the, the store and you buy a new access point, you may see on it that it supports 2x2 two two or 3x3 three three, uh, antennas. And so what this means is it has two transmitting antennas or two, two transmitting antennas and two receiving antennas, or correspondingly three and three. So um, the more antennas you have, the better the performance uh, will be. And finally, Wi-Fi now supports enterprise security, which means that you can use an authentication server in addition to strong over-the-air encryption. So this is very popular for uh, you know, commercial applications where security is, is paramount. Okay, so let's move on to Bluetooth. Uh, in terms of the network topologies, Bluetooth started out as a simple cable replacement, so its primary uh, network topology was a point-to-point. -point. Uh, it has now advanced to a star. In Bluetooth terminology, this is called a PicoNet. So with Bluetooth, you can have up to seven devices, active devices connected, and many more uh, passive devices connected to the network. Um, but they do go through a central uh, access point uh, type device. Bluetooth supports diverse applications, such as data transfer, audio, and audio visual remote control. Um, it's very popular, as I'm sure all of you use it, um, you know, with the consumer-focused applications. Bluetooth Low Energy is a recent addition to the standard. This is uh, supporting low power, low data, low duty cycle applications. The typical application throughput is 260K. And Bluetooth Low Energy is targeted for devices which are meant to run off of a coin cell battery. So you may, uh, you may be developing a device uh, which you need to operate for several years, uh, and Bluetooth Low Energy um, has a low enough power that you may be able to do that for quite a while. 
Okay, so Bluetooth Low Energy also supports 128-bit AES security for, uh, you know, for a commercial application which needs security, and it does have an undefined number of active slaves. Okay, finally, we have 802.15.4. Uh, the networking topologies for this, uh, the first and foremost is the mesh networking. Uh, it's really what 802.15.4 is known for. Um, it supports both peer-to-peer -peer and ad hoc and static topologies. Uh, Zigbee can also support a star network or a point-to-point -point network. Um, in Zigbee, a full function device um, is generally the coordinator and the endpoints are often known as reduced function devices. Uh, 802.15.4 is just starting to come out with IPv6 support to support the longer um, IP addresses. Uh, Zigbee Smart Energy 2.0 and 6 Low WPAN are two examples of standards that um, will support that. Other features are uh, low output power, um, low data rate, and 128-bit AES encryption. Okay, so in summary, Many trade-offs must be considered when adding wireless connectivity to embedded systems. Some key choices include your network topology, do you need a star, do you need a mesh, uh, wireless standard, is Bluetooth or Wi-Fi better for your application, uh, what type of antenna, would your application be better with an external antenna or an internal antenna. CEL has uh, over 50 years of experience in wireless design, development, and sales. We are happy to help you find the right solution for your wireless application. Uh, if there's anything I can do to help, please, you know, come and talk with me afterwards. We also have our CEO, Paul Minton, in the back. And one of our regional sales managers, Patrick Marshall, up in the front. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>